All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second talk of track one today. Joining us live from Sorrento is Eric Brecholt. Uh, he's been around the Plon community for many years and more recently has been developing on Guillotina and working on front end development. So you kind of went the opposite way of me. You know, I started on front end, moved to back end, and you went started with back end and now working on front end. Um, so Eric today is going to talk about AbFab, um, talking more about front end development. So go ahead, Eric. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you very much. Thank you. So last year, I've used a t-shirt to display my slides, but that's 2020 now, 21, sorry. So not good anymore, not good enough. Um, as demonstrated by Guy Debord, this is the society of the spectacle, right? So we are permanently pressured by mass media, by social media. We make ourselves slaves of our own online reputation, constantly pushing back the limit of nonsense and insanity. That's a sad world. And here I am for a miserable new attempt this year for what it works. My slides will be t-shirt. So about me. I started playing with Plon uh, in, 20, uh, in 2006, and um, it led me to, to Python. Yeah. And uh, well, I got involved in the community. It was nice uh, to meet a lot of people, and I got involved and contribute more and more. And most of my contribution was on, on Plon 5. Oops, that side. Plon 5, yes. And you can tell that it was a long time ago because we are now approaching a plan six. That's the official t-shirt, right? Um, I'm not contributing much uh, in, in plan. I, I moved to, to front end. I moved to front end and that's, that's very nice. And um, front end, um, well, didn't move me away from the community. I'm still participating a lot, but it led me from plan to guillotina. And while well, Guillotina brought me to Ona. So Ona, uh, just to give you uh, a few explanation, it's a platform which allows to index tons of information into Guillotina and then search uh, this information. So it's, it's meant to be, done, to be used by, by companies, large companies. And just for you to know, we are hiring. We are hiring in the US and we are hiring in, in Europe. What, 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 what. Um, yeah, I don't know. You, uh, you watch TV? I, I love uh, love Death and Robots. It's a, it's a good show. The uh, robots. No, yeah, I, I'm not sure anymore about this T-shirt slide thing. Um, it's a bit limiting, probably. Um, so no, let's let's stop it here. It's I'm just making myself ridiculous. No. Uh, forget about that. So coming back to my last year talk, I was uh, talking about what I think about the current state of uh, front end, uh, criticizing the SPA pattern, which is um, well used everywhere, but also bring a lot of problem. We have huge bundles. We are over engineering the full thing. We are kind of breaking the original web model because we are mixing what is the browser layer and the content layer. So I explained that last year, but I had nothing done, nothing concrete right to, to provide, but that was my starting point. So then I tried to, to think about it and think it over and well, focus on things I don't like. I don't like NPM install. I don't like overcomplicated JavaScript craziness and I don't like endless CI builds. Okay, then the things I like, haute couture, champagne, HTML. That's a good mix, but what, what can we do from here, right? What can we do? Well, app fab, app fab. Yes, short name for absolutely fabulous. And here I come again with a t-shirt thing. Oh so yeah, I mean, 
when when I start a project, uh, I mean, I start a project. When I pick a name before any writing any line of code, when I pick a name, first I buy the domain name and then I buy a T-shirt. But don't we all, right? Um, so what is AppFab? AppFab refers to Absolutely Fabulous, a fantastic English TV show in the 90s, really perfect thing. It, and I, I think it perfectly impersonates uh, the core, value of, core values of what I want AppFab to be. Wacky, wild, and fun. Things we all need a lot. And moreover, British humorists have always been an inspiration for our community. So yeah, it was a good pick, I, a good choice, I think. Or is it a Latin reference? Because AppFab could be also a short name for Ab Fabricam, meaning on my way out of the factory, kind of. So it's a bit a way to say that I try to move away from the regular way we are building stuff in the front end, uh, is the front end community, but I'm being pedantic. Let's move on. So um, we are always being into trouble with front end. In the, in the, at the 20 years ago, we were like, yeah, why do I have five different versions of jQuery? Then in uh, 10 years ago, we were like, why do I use five different GS frameworks? And now we are like, why? And dying. So that's basically where we are. We always create new problems to fix the old one. And whoever not having the most recent problem is such a big loser. So I know all these GS frameworks are fantastic. There is plenty of choice here, of course. But what if I just want something simple? Okay. And well, if you, you remember the 90s, it was a good time because in the 90s, you have two interesting things, good British TV shows for one, and for two, super easy web technology. And if we focus on this aspect, HTML, HTML is cool. HTML is a true essence of low code. GS is not the web primary language, HTML is. And HTML has been fabulous since day one. It's, it's what makes the web truly hackable, truly accessible for developers, easy to develop, fun. That's what I want again, HTML. And so the idea is to say, okay, apps are not content right now we are delivering shipping application as if there were content. Everybody does that. This is rude. This is wrong. We should not go that way. The web pattern is about delivering content. And the browser is supposed to be the application. So OK, we are not free to build the browser we want. But we have to think about the way we could fix the pattern we have damaged. So what about? considering components could be content. Components are nice. Components, something kind of new. I mean, not super new, but it's, it's what framework right now use. The component approach is efficient. It, it's an efficient way to structure an application, an efficient way to maintain, maintaining over time, reuse stuff, et cetera. This is good. Actually, HTML is built that way. You have a HTML component to build your, your, your DOM. But if we think about this custom application, it's also very nice to use this pattern, which has been provided through the SPA pattern. Well, my idea with AppFab is that we move that to server side. That means we store the components, the front end components, as content into our back end. And they are served dynamically to the front end. So, how does it go? Imagine you have a server. Let's say Guillotina, it could have been Zope, it could have been Plon, but a server able to uh, store a hierarchy. Okay. So the, the hierarchy strategy is very, I mean, is everywhere on the web model. So we know it works. My idea is to use it to manage components. So you're going to have a tree, just like you would have a tree of contents in your website, you have a tree of, of components and they have dependencies. So each component as subcomponent, et cetera. That's the file system. File system is a good paradigm. Developers love it. Okay. 
stop. So how it goes? You gonna have a call for a content. Let's say it's a poll. So you will get from the server an HTML page. And this HTML page will contain, uh, will also come with a JSON, the data. It will also provide the component, the main component to render the poll. So let's say it's a bar chart. Okay, you get your bar chart component. This component is probably using sub components like a button, for example, et cetera. The title, you can name it. I mean, you have sub components. All of that gonna be loaded dynamically because we have an initial content which needs it, okay? Then second time, you're gonna display another poll. Well, you will have a call for this and you will not get the HTML because that's still front end. So that's self from the, from the server side, but that behaves like an application. So we don't need to have the HTML again. We will not reload the page. We'll just get the JSON, okay. And we will get the new component we need if it happens to be a new one. So in that case, it's gonna be a map chart, all right. Well, the button, we already have it. It's in our cache, so no need to load it, et cetera. So we will just need to load what's missing compared to the initial page we were. And every time we're gonna navigate, that's gonna be like this, only loading the difference. So it behaves like an app, like a front end app. And it updates as a website because when you want to change a button component, you just replace this on the, on, the back, on, on the back end and any page needing it will just load the new version. You don't have to rebuild anything. So that's something we could call a transitional app. This name comes from Rich Harris, which is, who is the creator of Salt. And uh, I think it's a nice name. Uh, I think it works. Uh, it is not necessarily using it in the same context as I, I am, but that's the idea that you should move away from the SPA model and have something which is more adaptive, let's say. So what do you get? First, you have no bundles. Nothing is bundled. Everything, every single component you're gonna create is gonna be compiled by its own and will have dynamic dependencies. How does that work? So let's say you have a component with dependent other components. Well, it just import it. And when I mean import, I mean import. That's the ESM support. So ESM stands for ECMAScript module. And it's not module federation at all. Module federation is something from Webpack. So it's still about bundling stuff, but just making sure that your bundle can dynamically get dependencies and plug them dynamically. So here is just about your browser being able to interpret, import, blah, blah, import such file. It works. That's not something I build. That's something your browser provides, okay? So when I compile a component in AdFab, it will compile just its own code and everything which is imported will still be imported on the compiled, ver compiled version, okay? So that's also the idea to do something which is low code. Um, and that's why I, I choose Svelte. Svelte is super simple. Svelte is a component framework, just like React, and is super light. And it could be considered in the AppFab thing like the templating layer. At the time you were using uh, Clone with Jinga or whatever, um, you have this templating layer where you can do HTML and put some dynamic information to that. What's that exactly what Svelte is gonna do for AppFab? And well, I know some people are working on, on, on a way to generate HTML on the back end again, like uh, GSX is, uh, HTML, sorry, is about it. I don't believe in this approach much. I think that front end technology are good. They are really improving the user experience. They are really improving the web. So this I wanna keep. I wanna keep this. I wanna keep the component principle, but I just want to make sure that we are not adding extra pen for the developer. My main purpose is a developer experience. So let's see how Svelte works. Well, if you try to do a hello world in React, it's gonna be something like this. It's not long, it's not a lot of code, but still it's, sorry, but it's ugly. That's not, that's not cool. It's just to do hello world, you have this kind of stuff. And well, we are lucky there is no class here, right? But wait for it. 
Let's go with the Angular version. Okay, now we have a decorator, a class, and blah, 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 just to have hello world. No, 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 sorry, but um, I, it's difficult to digest, really. I cannot swallow this kind of stuff. Definitely not. So let's check what Zell does. Oh, that's HTML. That's HTML. And remember, HTML is cool. It's cool since day one. And that's what I call a proper and sane and reasonable hello world example. H1, hello world, H1. Wow, I love that. And what's cool is that this is a valid Svelte component. This can be compiled to Svelte. You would say, yeah, no need to compile it, that's HTML. Yes, true, but I mean, I mean, it is supported that way. So the best way to do hello world with Svelte is like this. So that's, that's, that's really super good. And well, if you consider what you enjoyed with the Python templating system we had, um, I don't think that's really Python. That was not Python, Python, the cool part of it. The cool part of it was HTML. It was nice to do uh, server-side templating because you were just creating HTML and putting some dynamic part into it if uh, loops this kind of stuff and that was working and that's very much what's missing in react and all the, the, the traditional framework we have now we don't have this ability to directly act on the html and i think it's super nice and super fun to be able to so let's move on with file if you need uh, some css well guess what you add a style tag okay that's not something totally crazy to imagine, right? If you need, but yeah, remember, that's still something going to be compiled. That means this style is going to be uh, encapsulated in the component. It will not pollute the rest of your page, et cetera. That's done the proper way. That's done the component way. But that's still very classical HTML. If you need script, wow, script tag, here we go. So in that case, here we see that uh, Svelte is also offering a, an actual templating layer because I create a, a let, a, a me, variable and I in inject it in my template with curly bracket me, which is kind of easy to understand. Good. And the good thing is it actually behaves as components. That means I can create something else, another component where I'm gonna import my hello Svelte component and display it. So that's this thing we didn't add it with uh, server-side templating. We had macro stuff like this, but it was not backed with an actual component approach. So that's a real component approach. So we have everything, everything all together. The, the good from the front end and the good from the HTML approach. Plus it is reactive. Okay, so reactivity is that something um, we, lot, we, we care a lot about, of course. In Svelte is extremely easy. And the way to explain it is incredibly simple. You just think about an Excel spreadsheet. In an Excel spreadsheet, when you put a formula with equal such cell twice two, it's gonna be twice the value from this cell, whatever happened, whatever you do, you change something, some, something else, etc. This will be always, always true. Well, the way to put that with Svelte is to prefix a line or a block or a function or whatever with dollar. With dollar, it means this will be always true. That's what reactive programming is. No need to go into super complex uh, explanation and concept and everything. Reactive programming is about to be able to write a line once and it will be always true. You do it that way. So um, now we have those Vels component and I explain you how it works. What as Fab is doing, basically, Every time you have a component, it is stored on Guillotina with its own source, so the kind of stuff I've been shown, and also its compiled version. So the compiled version is always uh, save, saved uh, with, with the source altogether. And you can also create content because, I mean, Guillotina is super capable. You can create objects. You can create many, many things into, into that. Well, you can say this content in guillotina will be associated with this component. It's gonna be its view, all right? And 
the server, the AFAP server, is smart enough to understand when we ask for such or such resource to serve it as JSON, as HTML, if that's the first page we are loading, or as the JavaScript, if that's the JavaScript we want to, to run. So all of that's going to be transparent. You just call for something, and it will render it the proper way. If you already are into the navigation, it's already started, you will never get HTML again. You just get JavaScript and JSON. And all of that, of course, generate tons of requests. I'm aware. I don't care. Um, it's, it's maybe a bad approach. I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing it's smart, but um, it works. Of course, it works um, better with HTTP2. So the default setup you get with AppFab is obviously enabling HTTP2 and HTTPS mandatorily. And yes, you have a tons of requests, but they are all super small because that's no bundles, just super simple components. Like you load a button, it's going to be loaded once because everything is cached. And then you're going to load the checkbox and everything. But at the end, it's not a lot of data. It's just a lot of requests. And through HTTP2, it's pretty sane. And we are using Guillotina for what it, is, it does very, very well because that's a great API. You get a tons of feature for free. It's secure. It's uh, super good at storing a bunch of small items, like in a tree, exactly what I need. And it's fantastic at handling, handling bunch of simultaneous requests. So that's exactly the thing I need, right? And uh, so basically, AppFab is turning Guillotina into a um, front-end component storage system. That's what it is. It's like it's a super cool and fast and dynamic web file tree. You can see it like this. Now, my objective with AppFab is to make the developer experience as smooth and pleasant as possible. And I don't mean super high ranked uh, developer, super, super stars or whatever. I mean, anyone. Anyone able to do HTML should be able to do uh, AppFab stuff. So when it comes to deep, AppFab is a server, right? You have Guillotina, so it implies you have also Postgres, you have uh, Python into that, and you have also, I mean, many things like this. And yeah, um, kind of explanation, like you just installed Postgres 9, well, 10 might be supported, well, you'll see, and then pip install, uh, it always, always fail at the end. And then, oh, uh, on Windows, I'm not sure, never tried. So not a good thing. My way to make it simple is Docker. So with AppFab, everything is deployed with Docker, only Docker, just Docker. That's either locally for your own local server than for uh, the prod server, everything is on Docker. And low build. So we've been through low code, low deployment, low build. Low build, yeah, I don't want NPM install. I don't want Webpack. <sighs> okay, but at some point you need something, right? How do you do that? Um, my first, my, 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 my the, the thing pushed me to, to move with, with AppFab was when I discovered that a colleague of mine, so that's a UX guy uh, in my company, his name starts with A, um, is Catalan. Um, you might know him. He's been involved in many things in Plone. He's a US guy. I mean, yeah, a bit grumpy. You see the guy. Um, and I saw him. He was modifying CSS and HTML uh, through the GitHub web interface. So, you know, in, on GitHub, you can edit something and you change, and then it makes a commit. And, and then, well, you see how you're going to start, right? So, he was doing that on our on project in the company, and then waiting for 30 minutes until the full thing is compiled and deployed through Jenkins and all the blah, blah. And I was like, why, why, why Git? Why, why do you do it like this? Are you, are you stupid? And to be honest, it was kind of rhetorical question, right? I had a pretty good idea of the answer I had for this question. And it told me, it told me, yeah, but when I try to deploy NPM install and it, does not work, and and when I, I have to reuse it like uh, two months uh, later, it's 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 broken and painful. So yeah, it's too painful, too painful to have a local build 
when you are a front developer, you have to do that. You have to fight this every day. Uh, it's going to make your fan go crazy on your laptop. That's, that's not good. So how do we go? How do we build something on a sane way without this? I add an ID to the web. Yeah, so why through the web again and again and again and again? I, I, I've been there, right? I've, I, I've been through many, many different aspects of that. I don't know. I think I am attracted. Um, the idea that the program can, is able to change itself. That's, that's, yeah, that's probably the best way to shoot yourself in foot, right? Probably, but I love the idea. Um, I remember the first C program I did, it was just deleting itself. And uh, the first time I implemented it, um, I did it wrong because I, I made it uh, remove the, the C file, so the source, and then I was fucked. I had to recode it. And, and then I, I changed it so it, it, it removes the executable. But so that's stupid probably, but it, I was fascinated. This ability to change yourself as a system. And yeah, I'm, I'm 47, um, an age where you are supposed to accept who you are. I'm Eric, I like through the web shit. <laughs> and uh, this time uh, it comes with a different flavor. So it's not, uh, it's not like Plomino where you have a huge UI with lots of fields where you enter stuff and options to select, etc. It's only code. So it's code only. It's not like Rapido because here the focus is on simplicity. It should be easy and accessible for everyone. Rapido was not because because Yazo, right? Yazo, XSLT, XML, yeah, does not work. Failure. So here is um, the through the web way uh, with um, with AppFab. So I had prepared some video. But live demo, no. Let's go. Let's try live demo. So this is AppFab on page. So yeah, um, I like uh, a small icon on the top corner. I think it's classy. So yeah, that's AppFab. So you get to log, of course, and then you enter the um, the online interface. So here you have uh, a file tree where you can, uh, you can create new components, new project, whatever you want. So let's go. I'm going to go on the root and create a folder. Name it test. And in there, I'm going to create a component. So it's going to be hello.zelf. So as the extension is Zelf, it's going to be uh, compiled whenever I need. So let's start with my initial example. I save and I can preview it. All right, good. So now let's make it a bit dynamic for fun. Oh, no, that's live demo stuff, right? We get everything wrong. So let nick equal Eddie. And I'm going to say hello, you. And save. Oh. Wrong, of course. I use you instead of me. Well, you see the compiler, the Svelte compiler is, is smart enough. So all of that is compiled into the browser. So, so the, the Svelte compiler is super small and has no dependency. So I can run that on my browser. It's like nothing. And yeah, it's super nice. It's going to give you um, warnings about some mistake you might do. Like here, the, the variable is not wrong. Is wrong. If I create a variable which is used anywhere, it's going to tell me if I make a um, uh, uh, accessibility uh, fault, like no alt on an image, it's going to tell me as well. If I have a, a class which is not used, a, a CSS class which is not used, it tell me too. So it's super nice. Okay, so now it's fixed. I save again, and I get my uh, my component working. Okay, so that's nice. Um, let's go with other examples. So I will not live code everything. That's probably too risky. Um, let's go with this simple example. Here I have um, a component which is creating SVG. SVG is always painful to generate. Uh, and here, when you have just a pure template approach, it's actually not that bad. You create SVG tag, and here, here you have uh, each loop which goes across the content cycle. So content is what AppFab push as a context, let's say, 
when you try to preview a content, it will be available for the component under content. Simple. And in my content, I'm supposed to have circles and I'm supposed to have a color as well. Well, I create as many circles as that I have in my content and they have different size and different location and the same color. So I want this component to be applied to a content like this. So this is my, my data, right? I have the color defined and the list of circles with different radius and position. Well, the way it's associated is on the folder, I'm going to say the view view, so the default view, going to be circles.svelte. Okay, great. So now, sorry, I'm going to close the editing. Here I go. Okay, it generates my small SVG circle. So nothing crazy, but what's good about it is I can, uh, so yeah, of course, I can change whatever I want. If I change the color here and I save, we're going to render with the right color. I'm colorblind, so I don't give a shit. But anyway, um, what is cool about it is it's publicable. So I can, of course, access this in his own page if I want. So this is my page, my component, if that's dynamic. And I can also embed it into another web page. It can be done with as a web component. I mean, I'm going to import a script, which is going to create dynamically my own custom element, which is going to be app fab element, and I provide the content path for my data. So that's a snippet of code I can pass. I put that wherever I want. Or if I have security restriction with scripts, I can use an iframe. And that's exactly, exactly what I did on this GitHub page. So here on this GitHub page, I have the two examples, the one with the iframe. Well, it's not necessarily perfect regarding accessibility and usability, et cetera, but Sometimes you don't have a choice and it can be also a custom element. In that case, it's directly into the page, just like the rest did, and it's going to be themed with the rest, etc. So that's something super easy to copy past, right? Just like you do with a YouTube video, you copy past it and put it on your CMS or whatever it is, it's going to work. As you can see, they're still blue because it has been done before I, I made my change. But if I refresh the page, I get the, the, red, the red one. Okay, so that's totally dynamic and live always. But as I refresh, just for you to know, I just reload as data. All the components were already cached, so that's for free. Coming back to the demo. Um, so you can do this kind of thing, small, uh, small rendering like SVG, for example. You can do more complex application. Complex, not externally complex, let's be honest. Uh, in that case, I made a small contact manager uh, so nothing fancy. Um, here I have a list of uh, contacts. So all of them are fantastic people. Okay, only this, this content manager is contact manager is only for fantastic people. So Marie Curie, uh, Adi Lamar, and me. And you can create new content like John. So dot org. You say, so here you see we have navigation. Um, we go to another page, we come back to this page, we can edit something. So here I navigate again. So I leave my component giving the list and I change something. I save, now it's updated here. I can delete, I delete John Doe because he's not fantastic. Yes, good. So this work here, it could be also displayed um, in its own tab if we want. That's an application per se. It's a simple one, I'm, I'm aware, of course, but that's something you can do. You have an API to store, manipulate contents on the backend, create a new one, modify a new one, etc. And all of the contacts are stored in this folder. So I created it manually, this contact folder, and I decided that all my data are going to be there. And I have a way to search across the data, collect all of them, display them, etc. So that's just like you would do in the ZDMI, right? Um, and if I want it to be somewhere else, that's not a problem either. That's just uh, for, for, for the demo I made it that way. Uh, what I can do as well is, well, more complex rendering stuff. Like here, I want to display um, a chart. And the way I do that is by using an external library. So using this import support in my browser, I can import local things like Zelt itself or like a subcomponent I might have. I can also import remote one. This, this is chart.js and I get it from mpackage.com. I use the ESM, ESM version. 
to make sure it works. And then I can just copy past any chart GS example directly here, save, and it works. I don't have to deploy, uh, bundle, blah, blah, blah. All of that going to work directly into AppFab. And I get this, uh, this nice um, chart. Um, here, the data is hard coded and it's absolutely stupid, but uh, it could be provided by some data you have. So you might collect some data from an um, open data system or whatever. You put all of that in AppFab and you can display it. I think AppFab is a good, is a good uh, solution for, um, for DataViz because with DataViz, you need two very important things. I, I don't know if you're aware, but DataViz is about uh, two super important things. One is obvious, is data. You need the data. And two, do you know what it is? No? Visualization. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that was an easy one. No, I mean, yeah, you need that. Well, that's exactly what you can do with, with AppFab. You can store the data as JSON. I mean, it's an object. You put it in on Guillotina. You might secure it. You might do whatever you want with it. And you can also store the actual component able to render it. So it's all in one. So I know all in one is not the best approach for everything. But in that case, I think it's handy. Because you can do that here. It's on an AppFab server somewhere. And you can publish it everywhere. So that's kind of nice. Another example, just because here we have, uh, it's, it's, um, it's a graphic showing how many uh, extra kilo I got because of lockdown across <laughs> months. So yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you should be aware. It's important to track it. Um, so yes, that's what I have with AppFab. And an interesting thing is that AppFab is developed with AppFab. So if you, are, if you go into this AppFab folder, you get the actual AppFab code. And uh, it's, not, it's not super complicated. So you have Pastanaga in there. Pastanaga is their CSS and uh, fonts, basically. All the SAS variables have been turned into uh, CSS variables. So it's dynamic. So you still have the variable mechanism, but it's all dynamic and on the front end, which is very much uh, appreciable for for AppFab, you have a very minimalistic UI implementing some Pasanaga stuff, like you have a button. So it's just basically making the right um, call for the CSS class for a button. And basically, that's it. You might have, I don't know, an icon, super simple as well. And then you are free to reuse those icon button checkbox. And that's how I did this uh, UI, just by doing this, uh, copy pasting some small part of HTML from the Albert code and uh, put in the right CSS and I get my component. Um, the, the core of AppFab is actually very simple. Um, I mean, it's not simple, but it's, it's, it's small. Uh, this is uh, the core uh, JS library and this is uh, the main element here, which renders everything basically. Uh, the total is 200 lines of JS. So it's very, very minimalistic. Uh, the editor itself is a bit bigger because, yeah, you have components to display or sync, and you can do fun thing like uh, previewing the editor in the editor. It's uh, useless, but yeah, I like it. And um, and yeah, exactly Inception. So let's go back to my presentation. I'm gonna skip the video because I was successful with my live demo. Um, yeah, something important as well. Uh, obviously, um, sorry. Uh, you need uh, you need the, 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 any um, through the web solution to be uh, to be workable locally as well. Oh no, I come back to the very beginning. Sorry. Um, <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> Plenty of them. Anyway, um, so. Yeah, you want to be able to work locally. You want to be able to put your stuff on, on GitHub. This is critical. This is key for any through the web solution. We've been uh, in, in, in there so many times before. So yes, it is very important. Um, so you can work locally in VS Code or whatever it is. And you have just one command to sync up or down your content with your app, app server. And this, again, is not with pip install or blah, blah, blah. It's just Docker. So you have a Docker command, Docker run. Uh, it's a bit ugly for, ugly for now, but I will I will provide a script which just uh, does that, uh, get all the options possible and make it a bit more uh, user-friendly, let's say. 
Um, it's also fully documented. Well, when I say fully, it's not uh, fully, fully for now, but that's my objective. I am working on documentation first, and I have, yeah, I, I make sure that the code I do is, is, um, is consistent with the story I'm telling in the documentation. Why is that? Because I want, as I said, I, was, I want people to be able to use it without any pain. So it's, it's about pro providing something which is simple, but something which is documented. That's vital. Now, um, what is it good at? Mm, I don't know. Really, I have no idea. Um, I mentioned, I mentioned uh, data viz, of course, uh, probably a good use case. It could be used for small application like the kind of stuff I was doing with Plomino probably. Um, I'm not too much worried about what it is good at, to be honest. In my company, I see a point in doing this kind of stuff because we have a platform where we want to customers to be able to plug the system. So there are some backend system like you, they can push a processing and it's gonna transform data. So like you add some kind of uh, custom processing for the data, but we would also like them to be able to push some front end uh, feature. And then how do you do that? Do, do you say, yeah, please, you just upload your ugly webpack bundle there and we trust you about what is in there? Yeah, not sure. So I like the idea that you can push each component independently with a clear source. It can be recompiled by us if we want and this source we can read it and make sure it's, it's okay. So it's, it's a probably nice way to do that regarding security and also a nice way for the customers because they have something simple to use. So it's, it's, there is no barrier. They don't have to hire a React developer to do it. Uh, so that's one of the use cases as well I have in mind. But yeah, for, to be honest, I, I did it just uh, for fun. So for now, I don't have any much idea about uh, what, where it could go. And uh, yeah, I mentioned this. Uh, AppFab has been built with AppFab itself. Uh, and it makes sense because, I mean, AppFab could not be absolutely fabulous. It, would, it was not able to be absolutely fabulous and vice versa. So yeah, I'm quite happy about that. And Oh, sorry, can the video. Now, final question, is it totally stupid? Not to be entirely excluded. Um, I think I've made some very um, discutable choices in there. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, as I mentioned, it's 20, 200 lines of, uh, of GS for the front end, the core front end and 300 for the backend in Python. And most of it are uh, decorators because that's how you do uh, Python nowadays. So it's not a lot of code, which is a good sign, I would say. It cannot be that bad, or is it? I don't know. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, that's where I am. Thank you all. That was it. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we did enjoy the uh, history through the t-shirts at the beginning. I went and got myself my own Clone 6 t-shirt too. Good question. I don't know if we have time. <laughs> um, there were a couple questions in Slido. Uh, we have just a couple minutes. Mike asked, how do you provide libraries for local import? Yeah, you should un unmute. Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> Seems they can't hear me. Yeah, we don't uh, we don't hear you, Christy. Okay. Uh, unless you're not right. speaking. In that case, it makes no, sense. No, I'm I'm speaking. <laughs> That's all right. We'll move on to Jitsi. Uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so Eric will join Jitsi. Um, everyone else watching on Loudswarm, go ahead and join the link. I'm going to put it into track one. Uh, and thank you, Eric. Even though you can't hear me. Jitsi. Um, yeah, Jitsi. Yep. Go ahead and join him. Thanks. So I go to Jitsi myself. <laughs> 